we read this. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith, which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture said, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. It's a great gospel uh, passage uh, that could be used uh, during solving conversation, chapter 10, right here. Now, what's up with this? Ascendeth and descendeth. All right? We'll talk about it. That kind of relates to our topic, uh, dealing with gravity. Now, the issue of gravity came and comes up uh, when uh, people examine the whole idea about the flat earth. All right? Flat earth, globe earth, or whatever. And I looked into it. My motivation was to debunk it properly. I wanted to debunk it myself with some sort of um, logic. I didn't want to just go to book because somebody said so, right? That's not debunking, all right? Debunking is when you really, really know. That's actually how science is supposed to work. If somebody comes with a theory, some kind of thesis, and uh, put, it, put it in a formula and everything like that, there should be scrutiny in the scientific community. It should be tested, and it should be repeated uh, in a laboratory conditions elsewhere all over the place. And when it is... Uh, uh, tested and proven, then it's accepted as a fact. Until maybe somebody comes with a new theory that probably refine it, this finding, and make it even better. All right? But of course we know that certain things are sold to us as a fact, but they are strictly theory never proven. Right? Never really tested, never thing like that. And, and we've been uh, indoctrinated in schools uh, to understanding uh, that the world became just out of explosion, poof, and there was everything. And then we slowly from uh, bacteria to, or very simple cells to complex cells and to, to bacteria and, and all these things, we, we became complex organisms to a point that we became fish and we started walking and, and, and then uh, monkeys and, and then here we are, just uh, really sophisticated monkeys. Well, look at that guy over there. <laughs> right, those, are, those are theories, and I don't necessarily... It's a funny theory, it's nonsense, but, but it's, uh, it is given to people as a fact. And one of those other theories, <clears throat> to my surprise, because when I started looking into it, I actually surprised, I actually got surprised that one of those theories is gravity. And so it made me to... S because here's my thing. Here's my strong belief. God is very comprehensive and very thorough. Everything that's uh, of any relevance, you're going to find it in the Bible. This is amazing. That means that you can go to a chapters, a bookstore. There's a lot of self-help books. But how many people go to the religion section and pick up King James Bible and look for the health, uh, answer there? And yet, this is the book that answers the most important questions in your life. You really align your life according to this book, and you'll be happy. Just simple as that. And you're going to be saved. And you're going to, this, you're going to have a good marriage. You're going to raise good kids. There's just so many benefits. And yet it's being neglected, right? People instead pick up Joe, Smiley Joe Osteen or, uh, or something else, you know, some sort of weird uh, books, you know, five tips how to improve your sex life or nonsense like that. Uh, so this is... Amazing material. Obviously, it's thick because, hey, your life is full of things. So that's why it's big, right? It's not a comic book, right? It's pretty, pretty, it's pretty heavy duty. And it takes some study and time to, de to be devoted so that we can actually get something out of it. Now, what's up with the, with the gravity? So actually, there is uh, something called law of gravity. But it's not a law, actually. You know, law is that something really works a certain way. And, and you know that there is a certain, you know, like, for example, Isaac Newton defined the law of action and reaction, right? So action and reaction is this. I punch you in the nose, 
and the reaction is you punch me back, right? <laughs> that, that's the law of uh, action and reaction. Action and reaction in physics means that if you apply force in a car, the car will start moving and eventually will hurt something and it will be same force that I apply to the car unless there is a friction and a few other things. So that's the law and, and we, we can put it in formula, we can use it in physics, we can use it in construction and engineering and it really works. It's a law. We know it works. But the law of gravity, well, it is a law because you know it's there. But the way it is defined, I'm telling you, in scientific community, is a theory. They really don't know that. And um, if you are, you know, um, nerd into physics and stuff like that, the formula is this, that the force, because there is a force that pulls you down, the force is defined as one object time mass of one object multiplied by mass of another object so that makes it mass square divided the distance between those two objects square right uh, plus, uh, times some constant which is just a number so it, that, that really doesn't make any difference but uh, in, in terms of the scale of that force it is related to mass of two objects so in other words if two objects are very massive, you're going to have a lot of force. If the objects are tiny massive, then there is no force, gravitational force, right? And also, the farther these objects are, the more the force goes down. And the closer they are, it exponentially increases, all right? And so that's the theory. That's uh, put uh, to us as a fact, but it's not a fact. And this is called so-called Newtonian law of universal gravitation. So how does it apply in a world where we have a sun, sun has a certain mass, and earth is here, has a certain mass, and of course we are told that the earth is spinning around the sun, and uh, so there is a certain force that pulls up towards the sun because of the mass. That's the gravitational force. <coughs> but then there is another force, and that's a centrifugal force, which you know from, let's say, roller coaster and places like that. When you go on a road, and you go on that very quick hill, it makes you fly, right? So there is a force that pulls you up. So it's called, it's called a centrifugal force. And so that force, because this, the earth is spinning around the sun, is pulling the earth away from the sun. So one force pulls it inside, one force pulls it outside, and it's just perfectly balanced. So that way we are not flying away or crashing to the sun. Right? That's the theory. Just to show that I'm not an idiot. I understand how, how they say that, right? It's, it's not complicated. But I don't believe it. I don't believe that's the force. All right. Uh, the, the, the reason I don't believe it is because they really don't know either. You know, if you ask scientists, ask them, so what is actually gravity? If you really squeeze them, they, they can give you just the first high school answer. But if you really squeeze them, they're really not sure. They really don't know. All right. Now, a few scriptures. <clears throat> Uh, first of all, a little bit about Isaac Newton. They say, well, but don't you realize that Isaac Newton was a Christian? Isaac Newton was not a Christian. Isaac Newton was a deist. He believed in God. But um, um, he rejected, for example, the doctrine of Trinity. He didn't believe in God, the Son, and the Father, and the Holy Ghost. And in fact, he considered that to be blasphemy or actually idolatry, form of idolatry. So in his view, in his eyes, Worshipping Jesus uh, as a God was actually idolatry. So it's not very different from, let's say, Jews. Right? Jews also believe that Christians are idolaters and polit polytheists because they believe that Jesus is God. But of course Jesus is God. Jesus is God because the Bible says so. That's why Jesus is God. Uh, the Bible says, for example, Therefore the Jews sought to more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath but said also that God was his father making himself equal with God. That's the whole reason why Jesus was crucified. Well, there were other reasons like pointing on their sins and embarrassing them and so on. But in the end, the excuse, the argument, the reasoning they had in order to kill Jesus is because they, he makes himself God. Remember when... Uh, uh, Pilate asked Jesus, or asked the Pharisees and the priests and everything like that, what has he done? I don't find any fault with him. And they said, in our law, you know, he make himself God, and for that he must be killed. Right? Remember that? That's the very reason why Jesus died. 
And Jesus, when he was asked, so is it true? Are you God or whatever? He never defended himself. Because he, he would have to deny himself. So he didn't deny himself. He didn't defend himself because he indeed was God. Then he says in John chapter 10, I and my father are one. All right? They were, we equal. We are, we are together. We are one. Also, <clears throat> the devil said unto Jesus, If thou be the Son of God. Jesus never denied that. You know, he didn't go for the temptation, but, but he uh, knew, the devil knew that Jesus is the Son of God. And so he tested him and said, Hey, why don't you then, uh, if you are the Son of God, why don't you then command and uh, change these stones into bread and that sort of thing. Um, so... Uh, no, Newton was not a Christian. Newton was a brilliant man, a little bit awkward fellow, right? He was not very social, but uh, he definitely defined a lot of uh, good physics that we use today. Uh, as you know, the Newtonian physics is, is you know, I'm in it uh, as an engineer. Um, here's a sad uh, information for Isaac Newton. Whosoever denied the sun, the same has not the Father. But he that acknowledges the Son has the Father also. You know, the Jews, for example, they claim they, have, they only care for the God. Not without Jesus. Don't have Jesus, you don't have the Father. Simple as that. And so, uh, this is, uh, of course, what we know about the Lord Jesus Christ. So, um, I will say this, it's an imagination, it's a theory. Nothing wrong about theory, that's how science works. People really try to figure out how things work, and they sit down and speculate and test things, and then they come with different theories. And this is how science works. You come up with the theory, you basically define, you, come, you, you define a little space where you say, okay, this is a constraint one, one, constraint number two, let's just define a little space here, let's just neglect certain things. For example, I just told you about pushing the car, and if you, if you let it go and it will hit some object, it will be the same force as the force that I put into it, right? Except if there is a friction. So for instance, here is one of the constraints, let's just define a space where there is no friction, there is a vacuum and a few other things in order to really see the pure results of strictly the force. And that's how science is done, right? You define certain pristine laboratory space and then you test certain things and you imagine, what if it's this way? Well, let's try. That's how science works, right? And then it doesn't work, then we have to abandon the theory and try something new. That's how really how we should do it. Unfortunately, there is no really proof for this, I, this theory with these two objects. You, you, there is no really scientific um, experiment that actually proves it. Right? So, so we have to take it as a faith, through faith. The only thing is there is this uh, pendulum, uh, I think it's in London, where it is humongous uh, pendulum with a big tower and then there is a big ball at the bottom, and they kind of, I don't know, they spin it, I forget exactly how it works, and somehow you're supposed to observe certain things. But do you think they remove friction? Do you think they remove air? Do you, do you, you know, and do you think they had it really precisely well? Uh, everybody can go and, and, and you say, wow, this is, this is a proof of gravity. You're looking to a museum of really looking at a waste of money, all right? Because here we have an experiment that really we don't know if, if it works. Well, if somebody uh, hears me say these kind of things, well, I say, well, you idiot. I mean, we all know that gravity works. It's used in calculations. I'm telling you, gravity is just a constant. Right? So if you use it in calculation, it doesn't matter what constant you use. As long as you define it properly, in the end, it's just a number. And you can come up with a different uh, metric system or unit system. As long as you are consistent with your concept, you put it everywhere the same, it will, it will come to a different result. Except, let's say, one ton would not be as heavy as a truck, but maybe one ton would be two trucks or whatever, right? So it's all, these are just consensus. And so uh, gravity is not really used in anything. We don't really use it in most Newtonian physics. I use gravity. You know, like a Newton is equal by uh, the constant, uh, the G, the gravitational acceleration. 
times mass and that gives you you know the the force that goes down uh, the, but if somebody defined the, the number g a little bit different way then it will be just a different number as long as we understand what that number means we will be fine just like a difference between inches and um, centimeters you just have to know what the conversion is right so it doesn't matter in the end so we really don't know what gravity is. The, uh, gravity is. Now, this is not a really scientific lesson. We're going to get to spiritual stuff because it's so cool, all right? But I want us to understand that a lot of the stuff that we are told in science is pure speculation. There's nothing wrong about speculating, but what is wrong when speculation is sold as the truth. The Bible speaks about science, falsely so-called. We'll get to the scripture as well. But I want us to understand that there is a certain motivation among people to really come up with the alternative answer to a lot of things in this world. And that's what motivates a lot of science. Because a lot of people in a scientific community, not all of them, there is a lot of decent people, but there is also a lot of people that really don't like the idea of God. They really don't like that. And so, they're, at the very least, they're open to alternative interpretation, right? It's almost happy that somebody came with the interpretation that actually is different than the Bible. They're excited. And they're equally worried when somebody comes with uh, an experiment that actually proves something wrong. It's very interesting. Uh, I forget the name of the guy, but there is an experiment that really puts a question whether our Earth is actually traveling somewhere. And I forget uh, the guy, the experiment, but uh, it essentially... It's, uh, it's, let's put it this way. If you send, if you could send somehow light, let's say this direction, it should come to the other side, right? But this is north and south, so east to west. Because we are spinning this way, we are told, right? We are, we're rotating this way. We're kind of running away from the sun. The sun goes there. So we are rotating this way from the west to the east. That means that if you could somehow send a light or some object this way and wait when it comes back, it should take longer time this way than if we go to the opposite direction, right? And uh, people say, well, there's a proof. If you travel from, uh, let's say, America to Europe and from Europe to America, it actually takes shorter time, you know, when you fly back or the other way, I forget, all right? Uh, except uh, th that's a silly argument. Be actually, you actually fly through the north, you know, like when you come to Europe. You fly through the north and then you come down to, let's say, Calgary. You almost fly over the North Pole, almost. And so, uh, you know, some of these arguments are weak. But anyway, this experiment, if you could just do that, then they would prove that really we are spinning a certain direction. That would be uh, definitely some kind of evidence. Now, this is obviously difficult to do, uh, but there is other experiments that have, that have been used uh, showing uh, uh, whether the light will, will come back in a different speed or different timing. And basically, it, proved it, it uh, really didn't work out. It really didn't work out. To a point that for certain years, there was a lot of scratching of heads it's like, how is this? And I believe that is the reason, that particular experiment is the reason why Einstein theory of relativity, and I know I'm probably overwhelming you with some stuff, but I think this is the reason why Einstein theory of relativity was accepted because it explained experiment that didn't prove that we are moving and yet prevented this whole idea that we're moving from being torpedoed. It's the greatest uh, formula, E equals mc squared. Except even today, the modern scientists are already saying, well, I, we don't think it's really right. E mc squared is not really true. So-called the greatest scientists. So I'm just telling you this. No, more, no matter how big name it is, it is important to really realize that we are not to trust a man. Not to trust the government, not to trust the... Uh, uh, I don't know, uh, even a cleric, all right? You know, don't trust me either. You know, you want to, okay, why do you believe that? And is it in the Bible? That's how it should work in, this, in the scientific community, right? But we live now in a world where everything is driven by ideology, right? We said so, so it must be right. You know, the COVID, uh, you know, COVID, for example, 
you know, you have to all take a vaccine, otherwise we'll die. That, that's not scientific, right? We, we, need to, we need to have that idea of scrutiny and accountability and also some sort of a backing. Is it in a scripture? Is it in some kind of authority that we can trust? But we live uh, in a world where this is being uh, denied and neglected. And, uh, but you know what? This is why we are here. This is why we are here. First of all, we're not going to just jump to any bandwagon that somebody wants us to, to get on. We're going to stand and we're going to scrutinize. We're going to think, is it true? Is it not true? Am I going to go with it or not? And perhaps this way be also a blessing to other people. Because there are a lot of people that are weak and they will go this way and the wave go this way. And then, you know, the politicians, he feels like, okay, this is what people want, so he will give it to them. You know, this is not right. We got to be solid as rock. And how we can be solid as rock that we know what we believe. I, you know, Apostle Paul confesses, right? I know whom I believe. I know. So I have no any doubts about it. And you know what? It's fine to accept, you know, there are certain things I don't know, such as gravity, right? I don't know how it works. I really don't know how it works. We don't know how it works. Let's just accept it. We know it is here. That's all. And as a segue, by the way, there is a lot of people that abuse um, and, and um, abuse the fact that people are ignorant of science and they come up with these silly arguments for such as gravity, okay? Such as density. Density is nonsense. Because if you put a vacuum, so there is no gases, no nothing in there, and you can create it, if you create, let's say, a box with a glass and with a vacuum, and let's say a ball at the top held with a magnet through the glass, so you know there is nothing inside. There's no gases, there's nothing in there. You can really take the vacuum to very low number. And then you remove the magnet, guess where the ball is going to go? It's going down. No density? There's no density there. And it just upsets me that somebody insults my intelligence, and it should upset you too, when you come with this explanation of different densities. The reason you're down, because air is lighter. It's just... You know, like, like, this is not complicated. This is what I'm talking about. Debunk it with science and with something you can see. So this doesn't explain it. Okay? Still it's there. The force is there no matter what you take away. It's still there. And I realize that if you pour a coffee or if you put water and oil, that water sits at the bottom and all on top. But if you don't have a water there, guess where the oil is going to go? Down. It always goes down. So that's how it works. Um, now, speaking about science, it's really interesting because in, uh, in Babylon, we know that the King Nebuchadnezzar, this is in uh, Daniel chapter 1, King Nebuchadnezzar, powerful king in that times, we're talking about 2,500 years ago, 2,700, 800 years ago. Here you have a very powerful king, and he has scientists. So this is what happened. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 1 verse 4, Babylonian kingdom is spreading and it's, it took over Judea, where the nation of Israel was. And what they did, they picked from the nation smart kids. Kids that uh, were good looking, smart, basically noble kids, and they said, come and we'll educate you in our science. And essentially, it was their way to sort of integrate a new nation into theirs so that there would be some sort of a connection, so that nobility would be of that, um, of let's say, ethnic group that they just absorbed. And the Bible says in Daniel chapter 1, verse 4, he speaks about children in whom was no blemish, but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science. It's not for everybody to understand science. Right? Sometimes it's just too hard. And some, some people prefer maybe this kind of science versus that kind of science. Right? But, uh, you know, he chose kids that would be understanding science. And, um, but the funny thing is that uh, <laughs> when there was this great vision, remember Nebuchadnezzar had a vision that he didn't remember? So guess who he called? He called all the magicians and everything like that. These would be people 
that he would say understood science. So here we have Nabuchodonosor. He's got a dream that he doesn't remember, much less understand. And he says, okay, everybody, all the science scientists, come here and you tell me what I know. What, what, is it, what was the dream? And they said, well, we don't, um, we don't, uh, we can't do that. And really what they were trying to do, they were trying to buy time. And they said, just tell us the dream, we'll interpret it for you. And he said, no, no, I bet you you're trying to deceive me. Because I think they did many times. And this is what sometimes scientific or very smart people to do, they like to do. You come to them with a question and they got to look very smart. And they have a title before name, maybe several titles before and after. And they scratch their beer, have very thick glasses. And for some reason, they always have under the elbow, they have a padding. Did you notice that? I don't know, what is it? You know? But that's, a, that's a, a picture of a scientist. And then the scientist will give you an answer. They say, ooh, you know, we just heard from God, I guess. You know, because this guy said it's this way. But these people are not really that different. All they do is just they have that long name. And they probably start talking in a language you don't understand. Right? They will throw a lot of uh, lingo that you don't, you're not familiar with. And as a result, you kind of fell in your butt and you're thinking, well, he's got to be right, whatever. A lot of people would ask questions, even at the conferences, right? They would ask a question, they get an answer, and they would say, okay, thank you. But really, they don't understand. They just don't want to look foolish, uh, you know, because it doesn't look good to say, you know what, I'm not really sure if I understand you, right? But, but this is really what happens many times. They really don't know what he said. And this is how it works, and it upsets me. And it upset the Apostle Paul because he writes to Timothy. He says, Oh, Timothy, this is his first, first Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. He says, Oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vab babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called. He is encouraging Timothy, be careful about people that pretend to be scientists. People that have a lot of knowledge and understanding, but instead they're just babbling. And be careful about it and be firm about what you found out from the Word of God. God is not going to mislead you. He will tell you the truth. And there's a lot of people in the scientific community that have that kind of fear. And they really treat science with respect and Bible as well. And, uh, you know, sometimes you hear about them, right? When you hear people from the scientific community, doctors and pharmacists, and they come out and they say, well, I don't think this is really true. I don't think this is really scientific. I don't think these vaccines are really that good or whatever. You know, they come up with all these different uh, uh, ideas and, and statements. But are they allowed to speak publicly? No. You know, because it's a science, false and so-called. We have to believe what let's say and you know so so called doctor D Donna Sheen she she what's her name says, you know. <clears throat> so anyway, it really depends what we believe. So let's go back to this gravitational constant, all right? This gravitational constant or this force that keeps us down. We're gonna depart now from the science and actually go to what Bible beautifully uh, says about this kind of stuff. Um, we know, we just know that there is a force that keeps you down, right? And remember, I'm, I've been um, motivated to talk about this based on your question, how come Satan is thrown down to the earth, right? All right? And that's going to be answering that, that, that thing. But I want you to realize that there is a force that points down. I also want you to notice that if you go to completely the beginning, when God created everything in chapter 1, you will see uh, important sequence of things. So this is easy to find. Just open the first page. Chapter 1. <clears throat> and it says that in verse number 1 and chapter 1, right first verse of the Bible, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Two opposites. Right at the beginning, God created these two entities, earth and heaven. Only on the day four, there are other things that were done on day two and three, only on day four, and you'll find it in verse uh, 14. 
And God said, let there be light in the firmaments of the heavens, of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and overnight and to divide the light from the darkness and God saw that it was good. You know, if God saw that it was good, I say, really brilliant, right? Because what God says is good, to me, is amazing, right? And so, clearly, first, where was the earth? And only three days later, and by the way, not three millions of years, just three days later, God created sun and moon and stars. We know that it's the opposite in the evolution theory, right? First, there was a bang, and there was a lot of energy, and things expanded, and a spin around, and then little uh, things kind of span off these big objects, and it cooled down, and it became uh, solid, and it's still cooling down, and it became planets. We, we, we are not ignorant of these theories, but it's not what happened. God made the earth, and only then he created a sun, and on the same day he made a moon, and on the same day he made the stars, and he put them in the firmament, in the sky. That's it. So, uh, um, and I don't want to necessarily get entangled today about geocentrism and heliocentrism. I do have a view. But I want to notice us that God made heaven and earth first. That means, I once uh, was listening to somebody and they, with actually God-fearing awe, they basically said, isn't that amazing that in the whole universe there's this little tiny speckle. It's not even a center. It's somewhere down up there, over there. And God cares about this little speckle. Baloney. God made the earth. That was the first thing he made. Everything. We're not sort of like a byproduct. We are the product. Everything is about this earth. Mm -hmm. And God cares every, very much about you. Not only, it's not, not only it's the center of God's attention, also a people of center of God's attention. Also, what is interesting, it's not really billions of years that everything has been around, just barely 6,000 years. It's amazing that ev, ev, all God's attention, the whole project is... Is the earth right here and everything that uh, that we are here that's 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 so amazing isn't it it makes so so much more sense and you know what that makes you also valuable you're not some speckle of dust like the science is telling you no you are precious in his eyes he cares for you and he hates uh, certain things that is destroying you he hates that he gets angry to a point, that, you know, there's some speckle. Why would he put a flood on some speckle and then it's little tiny speckles within the speckle? Why would he bother about it? The reason he bothers about that is because it's his project. That's all it matters to God, the earth. And so it is in his, uh, in his view and very, very important to him. So what is uh, uh, that force? Let's talk about force. Here's what I want you... We're gonna, let me just segue to another interesting uh, phenomenon. You know the Bible speaks about hell? We find the Bible speaks about man that ends up in hell and he is burning and he's thirsting. And he's asking, oh, Lord, please send Abraham, I think it says Abraham, or Lazarus, please send Lazarus to give me some water because I thirst terribly, right? The Bible speaks that it's a terrible burning place. The weird thing about all this is that this person's body is not there. The body died and is somewhere rotting in the casket. What is in the hell is a soul. And yet the soul has lips, has uh, arms, it has eyes, it can speak, and it suffers the heat. It's weird, eh? It's a strange phenomenon. That the Bible speaks about certain phenomena that we experience in this life, such as I know what it means to be thirsty. I can see and I can speak. And even though I die with my flesh, I can still speak and I can still feel this, uh, these sensations. That's strange. Mm -hmm. It's almost 
uh, surprising. So let me ask you, is it also possible? That's a heat issue, right? It's a physical phenomenon that we can measure and we can define. That's a heat, you know, ther thermal uh, energy. How about uh, gravitational force? Is this something that you can also experience even though you don't have a body anymore? And I think it is. So this is why this whole gravitational theory doesn't work because here's the formula. G is just a constant and M and M is a mass. But when you die, do you still have a mass? I don't think you have a mass. The mass ends up in a tomb. I, and, I, and yet I think you're still going down. Okay? This force, just like the energy of thermal and the desire for, for water or whatever, just like it is there even after, it is also perhaps this force even after. It's very important and very interesting because it can explain certain things. You know, John chapter 3 verse 13, Bible says, No man has ascended up to heaven, but he that cometh down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. The Bible tells us right here in this little tiny verse that no man can make it to heaven. And again, science will define for us, heaven is basically universe and space and all that stuff. And we can all fly there. We can fly to Mars and explore galaxies. Baloney! I wonder if they even got to the moon. I, I'm not saying yes or no. You know, I have a view. But, uh, you know, everybody can, if somebody believes, yeah, I think they did make it to the moon, fine. That's not a, that's not a big deal. But I wonder. I don't think we can get to heaven. According to this scripture, no man has ascended up to heaven. No man. Until now. But there will be a generation that will. I don't think so. There's no way we can reach to heaven. Now some people say, well, you don't understand. There is a Christian heaven, which is like above all the heaven. I get that. I think there is a third heaven. There's the heaven where we can breathe and where airplanes fly and birds. Then there is a heaven where we see the stars, sun and moon. And then perhaps there is a third heaven, as Apostle Paul calls it. And he says that he knew a man, it probably was himself, that was taken uh, to third heaven. And he saw unspeakable things. By the way, I'm so looking forward to the day when we see these unspeakable things. And we're going to look back. What, why did we want to still, you know, what were we so concerned about in this world? This is so much better, right? It's going to be amazing. But no man can get to the heaven. Because why? Because there's something that pushes us down. There's a force that keeps you down. And we read in Romans, right? The righteousness which is of faith. We have two paths. We have a righteousness by faith. And then we have a righteousness by works. By works means that you're going to be a, become a perfect person to a point that almost we're going to have to hold you down because you just want to go to heaven, right? But have you seen a person that can go like that? But the Bible speaks that there will be one day where we will be taking up to heaven. Like a little, I don't know, you know, it almost like a, like a helium-filled uh, balloon. You just want to go up. We will go up one day. But right now, no, no doesn't work. Right? Let's try to get rid of some of my sins, some of my past. You know, that would be a nice uh, weight uh, system, right? Weight, weight uh, lost system, right? Just, just, just get rid of some of your sins and um, put on a scale. It's like, whoa, right, I'm really good. I'm really successful. As I am thinking, getting proud, scale goes up. Obviously, that's not how it works because you can't really do it. There's a force that keeps you down. And the Bible speaks about the righteousness which is of faith. Speak it on this wise. Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven. Don't think this foolish idea. How are we going to get to heaven? Ain't going to have to get to heaven that way. Can't do it. Or also, who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ again from the dead. You know that Jesus went to hell, right? Jesus went to hell. Did somebody get him out? Who's going to do it? 
But what say it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that the word of faith which we preach, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. The Bible speaks, notice this thing. Hell is down, right? What happens to people that reject God? Where do they go? Down. What happens with people that call to Jesus? What did Jesus say to the thief on the, cre on, the, on, on the cross? I tell you, today you will be with me in heaven. You're going up. And he's going down. It's pretty profound. I'm actually surprised how much the Bible says about this kind of stuff. Bible, it's a spiritual gravity. Sin will drop you down. And sinlessness will take you to heaven. Hence, Jesus went down to hell. How come he went to hell? Because at that point, he carried all the sins of the world, right? So where did he go? He had to go to the hell. And you know what hell is? Hell is a bottomless pit. Hell is such a bottom that it doesn't have a bottom. That is the ultimate down. Hell. It's just he keeps falling. This is why the devil is falling. The sin is taking the devil down because he fell. It, it, there is no other way. And that tells me, by the way, that this earth is a bottom. Okay? This earth is a bottom. It's not a speckle somewhere. The earth is the bottom. And the inside the earth is the complete bottom. That's where the hell is. You follow my logic? So the Bible says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, Jesus was raised from the dead because there was no longer sin in him. God would have, have uh, risen him up. And um, the Bible says that with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Salvation means you don't go to hell, but you go to heaven. You don't go down, you go up. So we just discovered a formula how to overcome gravity. <laughs> and it looks, it may, you know, it may, it may sound like a funny, but I'm serious. This is the force that overcomes the gravitational force. The gravitational force is a sin that pulls you down, even to the bottomless pit. But if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're made righteous and you will rise. You go to heaven. It's that force. It's something that overcomes this um, uh, force that pulls you down. The Bible also says in Ephesians, He that descended is the same that also ascended far above all heavens. So Jesus is a person that actually can go up. No man can go up. No astronauts are going to make it to heaven. Jesus is going to make it to heaven. And whoever is part of his church, part of his um, bride, part of his uh, team. And of course we know how that happens. You must believe in him. You believe in him, meaning not just intellectually, but with a trust. And you bank on him. You put your trust in him and he will take you up. You will die. They will bury you. But you will be protected and on that one day, you will actually get a new body and we'll, Je we'll meet Jesus where? We'll meet, where are we, we going to meet him? In the air. Right? We, that's where we go. When Elijah was taken to heaven, how did he go? In a whirlwind, he went to, he went to heaven. And the Bible is extremely consistent with this kind of stuff. So, and notice, by the way, isn't that interesting that we have this deeply, in, deep-rooted desire to be high we, I like uh, hiking in the mountains and you know what when we finally make it to the top we would like to stay there for a while because it's such a grand view because it's more comfortable to look down as opposed to in a valley or in a pit and look up right when you, a person is full of himself and is proud what does he do right that's the look it's the high look it's looking down and when a person is humbled or maybe even like insecure, personally, socially insecure, what do you do? You kind of have that kind of look, right? You kind of, you know, you, 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 you even ex with your expression uh, show that you feel low, right? Bible speaks about Psalm 23, though I walk in the 
valley of the shadow of death. That's a deep place. It's not a place where you like to be. But we do feel when God puts you on the mountain. Even people when they worship false gods and everything like that, where do they do that? In the valley? It's always on the mountain, right? On high places. You know, th this is where people uh, like to go. <clears throat> And of course, salvation thinks uh, you're going to heaven and um, uh, damnation means going to, to hell. Uh, you know, the Genesis chapter 3, um, you know, it speaks a lot about damnation of a person for sin. And uh, we read um, um, you know what happened? Adam ate from that uh, tree, and as a result, he was cursed and chased out of the garden. But we often refer to this uh, thing, we often refer to it as fall, fall of mankind. Because when you, when you fall, you fall. This is, by the way, some of these Pentecostal churches, right? They, they go and fall backwards. There's something fishy about it. Why do you fall? I think because you fall. You know, we shouldn't have to fall. I don't like, you know, there's the song, we fall down, you know. I don't like the fall down. I don't fall. You know, if I go on my knees in order to give God reverence, it's not because I fell. I'll do it voluntarily. I, I bow down. It's not falling. But all this fallen in the spirit and slaughtered in the spirit, what do they say? Uh, slain in the spirit. It's such a stupidity. You know, there's no such a thing as slain means martyr. You know, the, the Holy Spirit doesn't murder anybody. Uh, maybe different spirit murders, but not the Holy Spirit. And uh, so bowing down before Jesus is not falling. But people talk about, we fall down. No, we don't fall down. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we talk about resurrection. It's a great chapter on resurrection. And the Bible tells us in verse 22, that as in Adam all die, that means we all fall, through Adam, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And that's the alternative for falling. So either we fall, which is to be in Adam, but also to be in Christ means we will rise up. It is also written in verse 45, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 45. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. So that's a person that fell. And then the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Quickening means to revive or to raise up. <clears throat> here's a scripture Matthew chapter 4 verse 8 an interesting scripture this is the temptation of Jesus we find it Luke uh, 4 and Matthew 4 so let's look at Matthew 4 verse 8 he says here this again the devil taketh him up unto into an exceeding high mountain let me just address one of the arguments of the flatter people <clears throat> they say well he is taken to exceeding high mountains so that you can see everywhere. Hence, it must be flat. And look, if it, is it flat? Is it not flat? I'm not discussing that right now. Right? But I just want to, I just want to debunk this argument. This is a silly argument to use. It has to be flat because that's why Jesus can see everywhere. Okay, let, let, let's let's listen what it says. Into an exceeding high mountain and show it him all the kings of the world and the glory of them. All right. Now, when Jesus was around, there were maybe 200, 250 million people, by some estimates, living at the time. And really, it was obviously the Roman Empire, maybe some other kingdoms. You know that there is no mountain you're going to be able to see anywhere. It's really not, it doesn't work like that, right? From the mountain, if you go to the high mountain, you maybe see 30 miles ahead. That's about it. So you're not going to see all the kingdoms of the world. But moreover, I am pretty sure when the devil showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world, he showed them all the kingdoms of the world. That means from the beginning of time to the end of time. I believe that when Jesus was on that mountain, that he saw America and Great Britain and Nazi Germany and then Spain and the Holy Roman Empire and Austria, and the, that empire, and Russia, and all. He saw China. He saw, and he was offered all these kingdoms. 
So when we think about this mountain, it's not really physical mountain in a sense, okay? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a symbolic language, okay? It's such a mountain that you see everything of all time, that kind of a mountain. It has nothing to do with the shape of the earth. And say unto me, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down. So notice it. The devil promised Jesus, as long as he falls down, he's going to get everything. Did Jesus fall down? Jesus, not a fool. All these kingdoms belong to him anyway. And he resisted and he did not fall. It's a beautiful thing. There is one person of all history that did not fall. All of us fell. But Jesus did not fall. He does not, he's not limited by this force. He took it, right? When you read Philippians chapter 2, how Jesus accepted that he's going to become a man, he's going to become a servant, he's going to die as a thief. When he accepted it, he humbled himself, he bowed down, but he did not fall down, right? And when he fulfilled everything, they put all the sins of the world on him, and not just at the time, or just the people that live in the past. No, for the people in the past, in the present, and in the future. And he had it all on him, and then the darks were dark, and then he died and went to hell. With all that sin, it was so heavy that he came all the way to the bottom. Until he rose up. It's a phenomenon. It's an amazing, perfect news that we have one that did not stay in hell. And if he one can do it, we can do it too. But not by our power, by his power. Notice in um, Acts chapter 2, verse 23, uh, I think it's Peter preaching to the crowd on the day of Pentecost, and he tells them, Acts chapter 2, verse 23. He tells them, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because I was not, it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Jesus is like the balloon that you try to sink under the water. It just will not stay there. It just wants to get up. And maybe it fell there with a sin. It's almost like if you take a balloon and you tie to it a bunch of bricks. Yeah, it will go down. But when that bricks is laid down there, the balloon goes back up. It just can't stay there. The problem is that even though we are hollow, we are full of baloney. And so when we go down, we stay there. And we need to be revived. We need to have the Holy Spirit so that we can fly back up. <clears throat> Luke chapter 10 verse 18, back to that uh, uh, idea with uh, Satan falling from heaven. The Bible says, and he said unto them, I beheld Satan, Jesus speaking, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Why? Because of his iniquity. That's why Satan, but not only Satan, but many other devils are falling down. They're going down. And I think that as we get closer, we're going to see more and more manifestation of devils because they're going down. So let's not be surprised if we see some paranormal activity. Even perhaps UFOs. I don't know what's going on. You know, it's clearly not a phenomenon that's uh, just uh, weather balloons. What is it? It sounds like a craft that crashed down, right? I, I, I don't know, you know? I, I just uh, throwing out there. It definitely is possible that these are devils, and they are going down. Uh, Isaiah chapter 14, famous verse about Lucifer. This is the only place where we find name Lucifer. Isaiah chapter 14, roughly in the middle of the Bible, uh, verse 12 there is a lamentation, and it says right here, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. 
I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. Did you notice that? What does he want to do? He wants to get high, higher and higher and higher, right? He wants to get there. But what does the Bible say? How art thou fallen, O Lucifer? And you are brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So not only people try to get to heaven, but also devil try to go high above everything, and it's not going to work. Because only one has the power. Have you seen this picture? It's a Tower of Babel. What is the Tower of Babel? A symbol of people trying to reach up to heaven, right? And what happened with the tower? Confusion. And the tower was taken down. This is a picture of European Parliament. This exists. This is in uh, Strasbourg. Uh, it's uh, right on the border with uh, Germany and France. It's in France. But this is the Parliament of the European Union. And um, it is exactly in the shape of the Babylonian Tower. It's weird that the architect actually put it this way. There's other weird symbol if you look at from the helicopter view. I mean, what's going on? What do these people have in mind? Um, Europe, you know, I'm European. I have a European passport. Europe, many tongues, one voice. Many tongues, one voice. Well, that's Babylon, isn't it? You know, except, uh, you know, one voice and then it turns into many tongues. But you know what Europe is trying to do? Take those many tongues and put them back to one voice. And let's build a tower. And so they build an even parliament like that. Here's what it says in Isaiah chapter 9, 11. Okay. 9, 11. Let's start with verse 10 first. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 10. This is a bit of a cookie sermon. <laughs> the bricks are falling down, but we will build with hewn stones. The bricks are falling down. You know what the bricks... See, when you build your tower to heaven and God comes and destroys it down because God will not have a high-minded spirit. Will not have it. And guess what people do? The bricks are falling down. But we will build with human stones. You know, we're going to make it better. The sycamores are cut down. Sycamores is big trees, but we will change them into cedars. Cedars are even bigger trees. Therefore the Lord shall set up the adversary of resin against him and join his enemies together. God will not have that. God will judge. High-minded spirit. You want to go up? You want to go up? Be like Jesus, right? Because he humbled himself so much and even died as a thief, God has highly exalted him. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. There, that's the funnel that takes you to heaven. Humble thyself. The ultimate humility is, Lord, I can get there by myself. I can't ascend to heaven. Help me. In humility. Please help me. And you know what? There's the force. Gravity has no longer power. You know, this uh, idea that people will build their nests in the stars and all that stuff. Obadiah says something interesting. Obadiah, chap I think it's just one chapter, verse 3 and 4. The pride of thine heart has deceived thee. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that says in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? Well, it's a pride. Who's going to bring me down? Though thou exalt thyself as an eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. You know what is interesting? When uh, Americans uh, supposedly landed on the moon, the symbol of NASA is an eagle flying with some branches and landing on the moon. You see the surface of the moon on the logo. There is the logo of NASA, that, uh, that kind of the oval circle. And you see an eagle, because that's an American bird, right? Eagle, with uh, branches. 
And the reason why eagle carries branches is to build a nest. So essentially what it is, is Americans are building a nest in, 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 on a moon, in a stars. Isn't that interesting? Is this funny? funny? So let me just read it again. Though thou exalt thyself as an eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down. And this doesn't apply just to America, but America first. America is going down. Canada is going down. European Union, oh, many, many, many tongues in one voice. Eh? You're going down. China, down. They exalt himself and, you know, all this. Uh, you're going down. There's only one way, God. And it's to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and let him lift you up. That's the anti-gravity device. Not some electromagnetic or centrifugal, some kind of machine. And uh, so on. And this is a weird thing. There's so many strange things. Of course, uh, you have E.T. alien movies all over the place. They kind of uh, really exploded from about 10, 15 years ago. You know, before it was just Star Trek and maybe E.T. the Alien, right? By Steven Spielberg. And of course, this propaganda to kind of get us uh, familiar with the powers from heaven and kind of treat them as good. Isn't it interesting? There's always some kind of story that there is this rocket ship from somewhere out of a galaxy and they kind of land here and, and somebody kind of crashed. Isn't that true? It's a, that's with the E.T. Alien by Steven Spielberg. Isn't that the, the plot? That you have this rocket and he kind of crashed. And there's other, other stories like that. It's always like that. But we will always find a way, like with the E.T. Alien, we will always find a way to get you back up. Ain't gonna work. But this is the propaganda of the Hollywood. To a point that even Vatican, you know, the current Pope, commented on the aliens. He actually commented on that, and he says this. This is in 2014, and this is current Pope Francis. This is what he said. If, for example, and I'm quoting him, tomorrow an expedition of Martians came. So he's talking about aliens. And some of them came to us here, Martians, right? Green with that long nose and big ears, just like children paint them. You know, like a grandpa pope, you know. You know, it's treating you a little, I don't know. And now it says, but I want to be baptized. What would happen? Who are we to close doors, he says. In the early church, even today, there is the ministry of Ostiari, which is usher. And what did the Ostiari do? He opened the door, received the people, allowed them to pass, but it was never the ministry of the closed door, never. What is he saying? Pope is ready to baptize, <laughs> even the devils. Because if there is Martians that one day fall down to the earth, guess who they are? Satan first, and with him the one-third. The devils. But the Pope is willing to baptize them. Well, because he is a devil himself. <laughs> baptize your own. Why are they looking into stars? Actually, one of the best observatories that are in the world are run by the Catholic Church. And I, I think it's correct. Actually, the, one of them is called Lucifer. I think it's true, isn't it? Um, all right, so we're coming to my final page. Um, few scriptures. This is the Bible. We can count on that. Revelation chapter 6, 13. We're going to spend quite a bit in Revelation. That's the last book in your Bible, so look it up. And in verse 13, chapter 6, we read this. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casted her untimely fix, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. You have to understand the prophetic speech here. The Bible speaks about mighty wind in the end. And great shaking. The Bible speaks about great shaking that's not going to just shake the earth, but also the heavens. And you know what shaking does to a fig tree? All the figs fall down. And so God is going to shake heaven, and guess who's going to fall down? Devils fall down. 
All right? And that which is healthy is going to stick. But that which is bad is going to fall down. Just like branches, we got a trees in the back. And uh, guess what happens when there is a mighty wind? We have a firewood. And never it's a green tree. Never it's a green wood. It's always dry, ready to burn. Because dead is what falls. And that's what devils will do. They're going to fall. Revelation chapter 12, verse 3. And there appear another wonder in heaven, and behold a great red dragon, having seven hands and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. This is the devil. This is Lucifer. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and it cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Let's leave the last sentence aside. But what did the devil do? He fell down, and he took with him one-third of all the stars. The stars are angels. Now, I really don't know what stars are. I made that comment before. It's one of those things that I didn't have time to explore too much deep. But as far as I know, there is no telescope in the world that you can peek at a star and measure the diameter of it. Every time you look, it's just a point. It's just a blinking light. So I don't really know if we know that these stars are these big suns out there. I really don't know. I really don't understand the phenomenon. And I have to only trust the scientists with an already lied to me. So it's very difficult to kind of go somewhere. Uh, moreover, I know that when the wise men came from the east, they followed what? They followed a star, and the star stopped on top of the house where Jesus was. Well, how the heck did that happen? We don't understand stars. I think I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think we understand stars. And I even wonder what the heck what the heck is it? Is it really this big body? You know, if it is, I'm ready to accept it. Just give me some proof, right? Not just propaganda. So I'll just leave it at that. But the Bible tells us that stars are angels and they are going down. Matthew 13, verse 47. But keep your finger in Revelation. We're going to come back in a minute. Matthew chapter 13, verse 47. We have a kingdom of heaven given to us. And the Bible says in uh, verse 47 there, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind which when it was full, they drew to the shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. Verse 49 now, Matthew 13, 49, and notice what it says here. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. And there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. They're going down to the pit. And those that are redeemed are going to be in heaven. Back to Revelation. Verse, chapter 20, verse 12. Revelation 20. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. As you speak about judgment one day. There is going to be a big dividing on a judgment day. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Notice, every man is going to be judged by their works. And they will go down. Notice what it says. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Lake is up or down. Lake is always down. This is the second death. And who said it was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That is even deeper than the bottomless pit. Because even the bottomless pit itself is thrown into the lake of fire. So I don't know what the heck is this lake of fire. But that is the complete eternal bottom that's where gravity leads now let's go to chapter 9 of Revelation let's 
This is a bit of a monkey wrench into the system, but we will understand in just a minute. Let's just go to verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So, angel fall from heaven, and he has a key of the bottomless pit. Verse 3, And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. So, interesting phenomenon. Here we have actually a bit of a reversal. And the devil, the angel of the bottomless pit, he is able to release some of these devils, I guess, from hell. And they come and they oppress people on the earth. Now, what does that mean? I, I'm not going to really... Some people imagine real grasshoppers or something. I'm not really sure if that's what it means. So I'll just leave it at that. But, uh, but we at least see the phenomenon that actually ascended from heaven and now they are in the earth on top, right? Let's go to chapter 11, verse 7. And when they shall have their finished, this is verse uh, 11, verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit, we see it again. We see the beast that comes out of the bottomless pit, shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. This is tribulation, all right? This is painful. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't want to mislead you. I didn't, actually, I don't think it is. Um, okay, take it back. Let's just notice that the beast ascended from heaven and there is uh, this torment of those that are, um, that are uh, on the earth. Okay, jump to chapter 17, verse 8. So we're talking about this beast that comes from uh, the bottomless pit. And in verse 8... He explains more about this beast, and he says this, The beast that thou sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. A, a lot of information here, but I just want you to notice that even the beast, even though they went up, it went to perdition. It's the end of it. Complete bottom. And of course, even the devil, we were, uh, I think, in uh, chapter 20, so just three more chapters to the right. Revelation 20, verse 1, we read, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years shall be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So this is a near future, I don't know how near, maybe it's going to be another few hundred years, maybe it's just a few decades, we don't know, all right? But there is coming to a time when the devil is going to be completely locked. We know that Antichrist and the false prophet are going to end up in the lake of fire right from the get-go. But the devil is going to be in the bottomless pit for a thousand years, after which he is going to be released for a brief time, and then he's going to the lake of fire also. Gravity. I would say that's the gravity. That's a force that doesn't end with the mass, with the body. All right? And finally, the best stuff here, Acts chapter 1, verse 9. We see Jesus go to heaven. After he spoke these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. Jesus is going up. And the crowd received him out of their sight. But we know that Jesus, this is interesting, remember the devil went to the bottomless pit, but then he is let out for a season, right? Here's what happened to Jesus. He goes up, but then he comes back. To do what? To take us with him. The devil is in the bottomless pit. He's going to come up to do what? To take them with him. See? Down, down, and down. But those that are redeemed are going up. Gravity. And he says, um, this, let's go to First Thessalonians chapter 4. 
He's coming back. Jesus is coming back. This is what we are waiting. The Lord can laugh at us. I don't care. He said that. He said that. So it's true. And we are waiting. We may be waiting for a long time. Doesn't matter. We will be waiting until it happens. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. <coughs> the Bible says, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise. First, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be in the Lord, ready for comfort one another with His word. So there you have it. It's the only way and the only force to conquer the gravity. I was not kidding. There is a gravity that keeps us down. That's what makes us human. And we are heavy with sins. All of us. Sometimes bad, sometimes not so bad. No matter how bad it is, it's disgusting. All right? Inside of God, even the nice things that you do are still filthy rag. So imagine what God thinks about your sin. Disgusting. But there is a force that overcomes all these things. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And you overcome it, but you've got to ask Him. Right? Humble yourself. Get on your knees and ask God, Save me. Save me. I don't want to end up in the bottomless pit and then lake of fire and be tormented and tormented and tormented and tormented and nine days for a thousand years, for another thousand years, forever. I don't want it. Please save me. And he said he will save you. Hollywood promotes lies. All these aliens rescue us. It's baloney. Nonsense. The only force that is count, able to counter the gravitational sin is Jesus Christ. Revelation eleven twelve, And they heard a great voice from heaven saying, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And final verse, Ephesians six thirteen. Therefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand. You don't fall in the evil day. And having done all to stand. It's a Christian creed, Christian virtue, is to stand. And when we talk about stand, we're not taken by all sorts of false uh, teachings, including from the mouth of scientists, or Kenneth Copeland and Joe Osteen, or Pope Francis, or any other idiot out there. You gotta stand. And the only way to stand is in Christ, right? Didn't he say that uh, he that builds his house upon a rock will stand, but he that builds his house upon the stand will fall? You know, I keep saying this dilemma, it's always the two death and life, faith. And works. And now we're talking about gravity, which goes down, and anti gravity of Christ, which goes up. Amen? Amen. So I hope I answered some questions. Isn't that interesting? Kind of different way of looking at it, I guess. With the devil coming down? That was your question? <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, let's uh, bow our heads. If you have any questions, we can discuss afterwards. Uh, the Lord, we thank you for uh, giving us uh, this wonderful promise that you will get us out of here as long as we put our trust in you. And so, Lord, we trust in you. And if any of us here uh, somehow doubts or have any questions and not sure, then we pray that you would speak to that person and give them uh, confidence through you. You are a wonderful Savior. We appreciate your salvation. And we appreciate the wonderful promise that you have given to mankind that whosoever shall turn to you in their pure faith and, um, and, and trust you uh, that that person is going to be redeemed and uh, taken to heaven one day. And Lord, there's unspeakable things that I can't even imagine because I didn't even see it. I just heard that it's amazing. And Lord, I look forward to the day when I get to see it my, myself. I thank you for this wonderful promise. 
Lord, help us to stand. Help us to be uh, grounded in the Word of God, in something solid, mm -hmm. and not be overtaken by foolishness and propaganda and lies of people that hate you or want nothing to do with you and pretend to be so smart when they actually are fools. Lord, I thank you that you are merciful with those, not that those that are bold and strong and, and uh, amazing, but you are merciful with those that humble themselves uh, and, uh, and get their knees dirty. And so, Lord, we bow down before you. We don't fall down. We bow down and give you our praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.